Good evening to everybody. I'm Fabio Santanelli di Pompeo from Sapienza University. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce our chairman today. It's uh, uh, Professor Demosthenes Panagiotakos. He's a professor in biostatistics, research methods, and nutrition epidemiology. He's currently vice rector and financial affairs research and development at Arocopio University. His research interests mainly include risk modeling and analysis, medical research methodology, meta-analysis, meta multivariate analysis, as well as causal modeling. He has published an amazing number of peer review international journal or papers on journal, and it's 570 and more papers. He published also three books in these fields of research, and uh, he has an age index of 54. So according to the international ranking system, Biomed Expert has been ranked in the top 5% in Europe in the field of epidemiology. Dr. Panagiotakos is currently board member of the SHARE committee. Thank you, Demos. Uh, Professor Sandanelli, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, for inviting me to participate in this webinar. Uh, I believe you can see my screen now. Yes. And, uh, I'm very happy to introduce uh, the seminar to, the, to our audience. And uh, I would like to say good evening or good morning, depending on which uh, region of, of the world uh, uh, you are now. And uh, I'm very happy, as I said, to introduce this, uh, this seminar and this webinar, which aims to raise awareness on the very complex topic of breast implant associated ALCL. Uh, it's, uh, it's a good opportunity, as I see it, to share uh, information on what, uh, what we do know up to now and uh, what are the gaps and what we should do in the, in the near future. And uh, uh, as I see it in, in my view, uh, there's a lot uh, more to do in order to educate uh, public and regulator affairs in order to raise awareness on this uh, uncommon, I would uh, characterize it, uh, disease. Regarding uh, the program, uh, as you can see, we have uh, four distinguished speakers around the world. Uh, Professor Santanelli di Pompeo uh, from Italy, uh, Professor Sorotos from Italy again, uh, and uh, Professor Di Napoli from Italy, and uh, Professor Mark Clements from the United States. Before I will uh, give the, the floor to Professor Santanelli to start for the first uh, lecture, I would like also to briefly describe and present to you uh, the opinion that has been recently published by the Scientific Committee of uh, the European Commission, uh, known as SCIR. SCIR, or uh, in other words, the Scientific Committee on Health and Environmental and Emerging Risks, is the official and uh, high-level committee of the European Commission regarding any scientific issues. I am proud to be a member of SCIR for the last five years, and also I'm proud to be uh, the rapporteur uh, that uh, introduced uh, the opinion to uh, the plenary of uh, the scientific committee, the opinion on the safety of breast implants in relation to anaplastic large cell lymphomas. Uh, Four years ago, the scientific committee received a mandate from the commission in order to describe specific clinical indication and uses of breast implants, to describe what exactly is breast implant associated A ALCL, which was the current knowledge of the incidence and the prevalence of this disease, the state on characterization and classification on breast implant cells, uh, and to try to figure out whether there is a causal relationship between breast implants and the disease, breast implant-associated ALCL. Moreover, in the mandate, commission asked the committee to determine risk factors for breast implants ALCL and which are the alternatives for breast implants. I'm pretty sure that uh, Professor Santanelli and Professor Clemens, who were uh, members of uh, this uh, uh, working group of the scientific committee, will uh, present you in detail uh, the findings of, uh, of this uh, search uh, and uh, the opinion uh, that uh, the Scientific Committee of the European Commission reached. However, 
I would like briefly to give you uh, a couple of uh, information uh, regarding what we have done uh, in this uh, working group. We have said literature uh, in April 2020. We have uh, found uh, approximately 600, 600 papers in the literature regarding this issue. We reviewed all of them and we concluded that uh, at the end there is a, a moderate weight of evidence for a causal relationship between textured breast implants and the ELCL. And this was recently pub published in the Gazette of the European uh, Commission and it's available uh, uh, on the internet. So uh, several points have been raised uh, up uh, regarding uh, during uh, our uh, discussions and in, uh, in the opinion of the scientific committee. Uh, there are several types of texture implants and they have been taken into account when we calculate the risk of the disease. And the, mask, the magnitude of the risk per type of texture implant is very difficult to establish due to the low incidence of the disease. And there is a crucial role of the registries and the lack of uh, relevant registries in order to have uh, convincing and robust epidemiological data to do a risk analysis, uh, such uh, the risk analysis we wanted to do. So, in conclusion, the scientific committee uh, concluded that uh, there is a, a need for further research to better understand the etiology of breast implant uh, associated ALCL and uh, the reporting of new cases throughout the world by re registries that already exist or new registries that have and should have been developed is of major importance. So by this, I give now the floor to Professor uh, Santanelli. Uh, professor Santanelli is a professor, uh, is a full professor and holds the chair of plastic surgery at Sapienza University in Rome. Uh, he's a head of uh, plastic surgery unit at St. Andreas Hospital also. And his main interest has been in uh, reconstructive uh, microsurgery, especially focusing on breast reconstruction. Uh, since 2007, Professor Santanelli uh, is, uh, runs a university master course on breast reconstruction at Sapienza University in Rome and is a well distinguished uh, author in more than 150 original papers and several book chapters uh, in uh, international books. Recently, he served as uh, an external member, as I told you, of the Scientific Committee of the European Commission regarding the opinion on breast implants associated ALCL. Professor Santonelli, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. I share my screen. Okay. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. We will, uh, I, I will try to give uh, an overview of the updated epidemiological aspect of this disease, the BLCL, uh, which will be uh, further discussed more in details in the forthcoming uh, meeting that we will uh, have on 8, 9 October 2021 in Rome, which will be the third world consensus conference on BLCL. These are my disclosure. So uh, that was, uh, as Demo said, the, 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 the answer that Cher gave to the European Commission on 2017. And in 2017, we were in a situation where there were not sufficient scientific information to establish a robust risk assessment regarding this association between BLCL and implant. And then the suggestion from Cher was uh, to do to, to run more in-depth evaluation and studies. And then uh, in 2019, the European Commission on Health, which is DG Sant, uh, again went back to Cher and uh, uh, asked those uh, points about breast implant, uh, current knowledge, uh, if it's possible to establish a causal relationship, and which are the measures to reduce this identified risk. But what is the, the share committee? That's something to be clear. Share committee is uh, constituted by 16 
different uh, uh, scientists, uh, which are permanent members. So they started to uh, set up a working group with four members from the share, which, were very which are veterinary, epidemiologists, medical physics. And this uh, working group uh, started a public call, a public call selective for CV, age index, publication, research fields of interest and conflict of interest. And among all the world, six scientists were elected to be part of the working group of the share. And these are the following, Mark Clemens, Daphne de Jong, Ingrid Oper, uh, Hine Rakrost, uh, Susan Tarnan and myself. And I'm honored to be uh, part of this group. So uh, the group, after a systematic literature search from 16 to 21, an independent meta-analysis, as uh, Professor Panagiotaki said, uh, evaluated 605 papers, and that lasted one year and a half, 18 months. So at the end, the final opinion of the share committee was that a cause for the very first time, it, could, it was possible to establish a causal relationship between ALCL in the breast and breast implant. Uh, the uh, level, the weight of evidence, uh, according to the uh, grading scale of uh, the European uh, Commission, is moderate weight of evidence, and we will go back to explain what it means. And then the texture surface determines the occurrence of BLCL. So BLCL is due to the texture or surface of breast implant. How to reduce is uh, not to use those implants that mainly cause BLCL, which are the macro texture implant. That was the answer from the uh, share to the European Commission. So let's look at the uh, primary line of evidence. It's the epidemiological line of evidence. And this is the main uh, reason to connect BLCL with implant surface. And let's see the incidence rate per, uh, per any surface. That was studied in 2017 by Doran, which uh, she demonstrate, they demonstrate that it's 0.002 per 1,000 patients every year. And that at that incidence already in 2017, that was 76.6 times higher than uh, uh, LCL in a breast without an implant. So it was already very high and significant, the incidence. But if we look at the epidemiological paper just three years after, like Nelson, Nelson goes up under times, under falls. So, and he states that the incidence of that disease is 0 0.25 per thousand patients per year. So it looks that it grows, but it grows because of spreading of news and uh, the knowledge and more awareness around doctors and patients, of course. So what is then the risk per any surface? Uh, the risk is the probability of BLCL occurrence in a population at risk. The population at risk is the population having the breast implant, of course. And, the, and Doran uh, can, they could demonstrate that uh, it's, uh, the risk is 1 per 30,000 patients uh, having breast implant. Uh, further studies by the board could demonstrate that that risk grow during time from 1 to 35,000 at the age of 50 years up to 1 every 7,000 at the age of 75. So the risk grows during time and the, the, by aging of the patient. Uh, then uh, it was studying also the aspect of the number needed to arm, uh, which is the inverse of the difference between cumulative risk with breast implant and in the general population over a specific uh, period of time. The bar defined that the number of patients that need to be exposed to breast implant, to any breast implant, in order to have the first BLCL cases is 7,000, approximately 7,000 patients you need to expose to any type of breast implant in order to have the first BLCL. The most important paper was that one in 2017, which was published by uh, Pat McGuire, and uh, it is not a prospective study on BLCL, but it's just a, a prospective multicentric study on breast implant. So it's a post-marketing study, and only by chance we could find eight cases of BLCL in that presentation. So basically, according to the number needed to arm, we should have found at most three cases, but we found eight cases. So 
the incidents in this, uh, according to this uh, paper of uh, Pat McGuire, it's uh, uh, one case every 1,000 or 10,000 patients, so it's much higher. Then we have the overall risk for texture-specific implants. So we move from the risk in any type of implants, including the smooth implants. Now we more focus what is the risk on texture-specific implant. And Magnusson could uh, demonstrate that according to the type of surface, that risk change. And being the most uh, at risky surface, the polyurethane from Silimet, having one case every 2,382, or the biocell, also very high, every one case every 3,300, and the Siltex much more uh, rare, one, one case every 86,000, but of course with the relation between biocell and Siltex ratio uh, more frequent in the biocell compared to the Siltex. Uh, then Cordero in 2020, it demonstrates that if you work on a specific category of patient, which are the uh, post-oncologic patients so that uh, are wearing implant because of uh, oncologic reason and reconstructive uh, of the breast, then the incidence may raise because most probably, and this will be explained by Professor Di Napoli, they have a genetic predisposition. Although is a generic predisposition, not specific, they have germline a mutation for genetic uh, predisposition, but not specific for the BLCR, but for any type of cancer, then the incidence raise and the risk raise, and they have one case every 355 uh, for a follow-up of 26 years. So it's uh, quite impressive, the, the possibility of having, if you, have a if you have any predisposition, and the incidence is 0.3 per thousand patients per year. If we go and uh, try to look at the overall risk for implants having smooth uh, surface, then we can find in literature some studies in 2017, like Singh, that studied the incidence on the uh, 52,000 patients, and they found zero cases. So we can presume that the risk is one case per an infinity number of patients having smooth implant. Similar, coronoids, uh, they studied 52,000 patients 52, and it got the same result, zero cases with the risk which is uh, one per in infinity number of patients. So we can uh, assume that uh, the, the risk for a smooth surface is uh, close to zero, uh, virtually to zero. Uh, although uh, recently in the FDA was uh, uh, reported uh, a case of a smooth implant that has no history of previous texture implant, and that was a kind of uh, confusion, but it was clear then in the last uh, um, work consensus meeting, when was asked to Benita Ashar, which is the, the director of the Division of Surgical Device at the US FDA, and she clearly answered, we have received the report of a smooth implant and LCL that has no history of texture implant. We have been asked if this is a pure case, and she clearly answered, no, we cannot confirm this is a pure smooth case. We cannot verify at this time. So now we can say that we have no smooth, uh, pure smooth case of BLCL. Uh, then uh, what we have done, we tried to study in, in Europe uh, how to uh, find out the numerator and try to collect the numerator in order to study the European lifetime prevalence, uh, which is a kind of, uh, is, is the ratio between the numerator and the denominator. Uh, it's a kind of, the lifetime, it's a kind of panoramic snapshot because we see the whole situation. The numerator, we have been studying and collecting how many cases we have all around Europe through the Europe Scientific Committee on Device Safety and Development. And we were doing the diagnosis of those cases all the, uh, in all the nation with the representative from each nation according to the NCC guy, uh, diagnostic criteria and guidelines. Then we have uh, collected also the denominator, the active population, which is the most difficult. And we try to find out how many uh, patients are wearing implants and we have been including. so 
all the women uh, older than 17 years of age in our denominator. We have been applying different uh, percentage to each category of age because we know that the board has defined that the women between 20 and 70 years of age has a prevalence of breast implant approximately to 3%. And then we reduce the number of uh, 3% down to 1.7% when we include also the category from 17 to 19 years of age. And then we also applied the, the rate of 0.15 to the uh, male, to, to, to the female transgender around Europe. That way we could uh, define the nominator. And then according to the European uh, uh, situation, we could uh, determine that in Europe we have 28 uh, countries and in 28 countries we could uh, find 420 BLCL. So the lifetime prevalence in Europe is one case every 13,745. But interesting is that if we consider only those nations that has really implemented data collection and case tracking, uh, which are 12 nations, they represent the 61 of the percentage of the population in Europe, but they can collect the 91% of the cases. And that demonstrates the role of the underreporting and the importance of the awareness. Interesting enough, also, we found out the importance of the type of uh, breast register because Australia and the Netherlands, uh, both surprisingly, have a similar lifetime prevalence with one case every 2,976 or 2,169. So it's very close. And this is most probably due because both nations as a type of option out breast implant registry, which means that you have to specifically ask not to be included in the implant registry. And that probably is the best way to collect uh, cases. So if you see at the updated situation, only few months after, six months after, we moved from a, a lifetime prevalence of one every 13,745 to one every 12,309, because now at the moment we have 469. So we grow about 49 cases more in six months in Europe, which with 16 dead still, thanks God. So if we apply that uh, um, lifetime prevalence that we have in the population that actively reports the cases and we apply also to the rest of Europe, then we can up in a prospective number. So we can estimate that probably now in Europe, we don't have 469. There is an awareness and under reporting and the most possibly number is 651 with 25 deaths. So going to uh, more uh, risk, the odd risk. The odd risk is the ratio between the probability of BLCL occurrence to the probability of its not occurrence in an active population, which is the people wearing, bearing the implants. So uh, the bar uh, demonstrated in a 26 year case control study that this odd risk is 421.8. Uh, and that's the probability of having this PLCL in the population at risk. And uh, what is the weight of evidence? Because all this study that we have done in the share uh, could demonstrate that there is a moderate uh, evidence of, uh, uh, of causal relationship. So the weight of evidence has been uh, graded according to five degrees. The first one is is not possible because there is no suitable evidence available. And that was exactly where we were in 2017. After that, there are different levels of evidence, weight of evidence, uncertain, what is not certain, the evidence and there are conflicting information. And then there is a weak evidence. You have an evidence, but it's quite weak from the primary line of evidence, which is the epidemiological line of evidence we just explained. And then we have a moderate weight of evidence. This is what the share committee established. And that means that there is a good evidence from a primary line of evidence, which is the epidemiological line, which I just explained. But evidence from other lines is missing. So that is considered an important data gap. 
And that's where we are in 2021. The only chance we have to grow is the strong weight of evidence. But to grow into a strong weight of evidence, we need to have more than a, a primary line of evidence. We need to have also a secondary line of evidence, possibly on a special mechanism study. And they should not be in conflict to each other, so they should agree. So that's the important, no, there are no more important data gaps. And that's the, the step forward we have to do. And it's not very easy. So my uh, provocation and is that uh, we probably have a second line of evidence, but it's not complete. Because according to my Greek remindings, ethiopathogenesis, it's a, a composed word. So you have the, the etiology and you have the pathogenesis. It's not only a single uh, line, I would say. So we know, and uh, Professor Di Napoli will explain further, the genetic predisposition, which are generic, but we know that some people can be predisposed to have that disease. And then we know the pathogenic mechanism, because the pathogenic mechanism is due to chronic inflammation. Doesn't matter where it comes from, but the chronic inflammation into the breast pocket stimulate the proliferation of the lymphocyte T17, and that play a, a, that they play a central role in the adaptive immune response. So this chronic inflammation then select a single clone from the multiclonal. They select a single clone that start and give the the BLCA, give the lymphoma. What are we missing actually is only the etiology hypothesis because we still don't know and we are discussing during time that if this is due to uh, reactive compounds on the surface or in the context of the silicon, if it is due to contamination from bacteria or if it is due to shell shedding of particulates from the surface or it is due to shell surface friction. So only the last part of a secondary line of evidence is missing, so we are very close. I have doubt how long can take to complete this gap, because this is an important gap, the second line of evidence. Uh, what can we do? Uh, we will be able to further and completely elucidate the mechanism of etiology and how long this will take. And what will happen in the meanwhile will pass many years, but we have to act, I think. Or we have to work more on meta-analysis and uh, on clinical research, like uh, multiple prospective randomized control trials, uh, it's impossible for BLCL because we should take 10,000 patients, follow for, for 10 years, and we have to implant on one side a smooth implant, on one side a texture implant. We will never be able to have from uh, an ethical committee the, uh, the possibility to run a study like that. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm open for questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sandanelli. Uh, for your uh, presentation and uh, the details and information you provide us. Uh, we will keep the questions uh, and your answers at the end. And uh, if you agree, we will now proceed to our next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Sorotos uh, from Italy. And he's going to, to talk about the clinical and diagnostic elements of breast implant associated ALCL. Uh, Dr. Sorotos uh, is uh, uh, a plastic surgeon and uh, works uh, in the St. Adria Hospital at Rome as Professor Zandanelli, and he's uh, currently practicing as a consultant at this uh, hospital. He has published several papers in uh, the field of uh, plastic surgery and contributed in uh, uh, more than 10 book chapters. And his main interest is uh, breast reconstruction, microsurgery, and basic research in the safety of, of breast implants. Uh, Dr. Sorotos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Panayotakos. I will share my screen. Okay. First of all, I would like to invite you all to the joint meeting of the Third World Consensus Conference on BALCL and the Seventh International Breast Surgery Workshop that will take place in Rome on the 8th and 9th of October 2021 and will be transmitted live on YouTube. So after hearing about all the relevant information regarding epidemiology of BILCL, my presentation will focus on the clinical and diagnostic elements of this pathology. These are my disclosures. 
I will start with uh, national comprehensive cancer network guidelines updated on 2021, which include as main physical signs associated with BALCL, the presence of an effusion around the implant, enlargement of the breast, a mass, skin ulceration, and more rarely, lymphadenopathy, skin rust, or capsular contraction. It should be noted that capsular contraction in isolation as the only disease manifestation has not been described yet, and therefore its reliability as a symptom of the disease is questionable and may be coincidental. All those symptoms usually present themselves a year after implantation, and the mean time of presentation is seven to nine years. Regarding initial workup, the first line radiologic exam is a breast ultrasound. It permits to identify an effusion or a mass, and at the same time, perform a fine needle aspiration of the, of the effusion and send it to pathology for cytologic analysis and CD30 and ALT immunohistochemistry. At the same time, we should always perform a culture to search for pathogens. This has nothing to do with the etiopathogenesis of the LCL. It's just that an, an effusion around the knee plant can sometimes be due to an infection. In case of a mass, a biopsy should be done and also sent to pathology. In an inconclusive ultrasound, a patient with no effusion, for example, collection, or any of the other symptoms mentioned before, MRI should be offered in order to better study the implant's health and the presence of any mass around the breast or in the regional lymph nodes. Patients with T-cell lymphomas often have ex-nodal disease, which may be, may be inadequately imaged by CT scan. So a PET scan may be preferred in this instance. I'm not going to focus further on the NCCN guidelines, as I'm sure you will hear more about them by uh, Professor Di Napoli regarding the pathology workup and the lymphoma workup and staging and the treatment by Professor Clemens. So regarding the diagnostic elements, the mean age of presentation of BLCL is 52 years old and the time of onset is nine years after first implant. In 86% of the cases, there is an effusion around the implant. A mass is present in 15.7% of the cases regional lymphadenopathy in 15% of the cases, and none of the symptoms in 3.5% of the cases. The disease usually presents unilaterally in 98% of the cases, and only two cases are bilateral, 2% of the cases are bilateral. So the question is, which screening modality is the ideal one to identify those symptoms and arrive eventually at the diagnosis? A very interesting work by Adrada and all aimed at describing the imaging findings of patients with BILCL and determine their sensitivity and specificity in the detection of the presence of an effusion or a mass. So a memory refresh for all of us, sensitivity is the true positive rate and it measures the proportion of positives that are correctly identified, meaning the proportion of those who have some condition are affected and are correctly identified as having the condition. While specificity or true negative rate measures the proportion of negatives that are correctly identified, meaning the proportion of those who don't have the condition are unaffected and are correctly identified as not having the condition. So let's see some of the radiologic uh, techniques that we use in BILCL. Ultrasound has been shown to have an 84% sensitivity and 75% specificity in detecting an effusion, and it is the highest among the techniques we have currently. While it has a 46% sensitivity and 100% specificity in detecting a mass. The image on the left shows a fluid collection between the implant and the capsule, while on the right we can see an ultrasound of the upper outer congruent of the breast with a complex cystic and solid mass. Regarding CT scan, it has been shown to have a 55% sensitivity and 83% specificity in detecting an effusion, while it has a 50% sensitivity, but 100% specificity in detecting a mass. The image shows an axial contrast enhanced chest CT scan with a large mass in the left axillary tail that has a mass effect on the adjacent implant. The real value of CT scan is in the detection of locally advanced mass forming disease in the Asian of the chest wall, local regional staging, and distant staging of nodal and extranodal sites. On the other hand, PET scan has been shown to have a 38% sensitivity and 83% specific specificity in detecting an effusion, and it is the lowest, while it has a 64% sensitivity, 
but 88% specificity in detecting a mass. It should be noted that the metabolic component of the PET uh, scan doesn't allow the determination of whether a peri-implant effusion is benign or lymphoma related because the cell density within the fluid is too low for an effective positron signal to be detected. I'm showing here an image of a CT uh, a PET scan image with an increased metabolic activity of the mass near the implant. One more thing to add regarding PET scan is that although it has been routinely used for other types of lymphomas, PET scan hasn't been yet validated for BILCL. Nevertheless, it remains the, among the standard radiologic imaging techniques used for patient staging and follow-up. MRI has been shown to have an 82% sensitivity and 33% specificity in detecting an effusion, and it is high, similar to the ultrasound. While it has a 50% sensitivity, but 93% specificity in detecting a mass. I'm showing here an image of a bilateral axial fat suppressed tissue weighted MRI image with an implant infusion and a crenellated appearance of the right implant cell. We shouldn't forget, nevertheless, that MRI concerning breast implants has been shown to have the highest sensitivity, 90%, and 97% specificity regarding implant rupture detection. And this is very important. It is also able to discriminate the nature of implanting prosthesis or injected materials. And more importantly, its sensitivity of cancer detection is not reduced because of the implants. So I'm showing a picture of a capsular contracture in an axial MR, uh, a T1 weighted sequence with very thick low signal fibrous capsules surrounding the implants on the left. And on the right, there is a keyhole sign and teardrop sign, signs of all of, all of them are signs of implant rupture. Now, if we want to compare and see the strength and the weaknesses of all the radiologic techniques in BILCL, we can see that ultrasound should be the first line test for detecting an effusion and a mass. This is also because at the same time, we can perform a sampling of the effusion and a biopsy of the mass. If ultrasound is inconclusive, then MRI is considered to be the second line best technique to be used. In, uh, I believe that MRI should always be used for the reasons I mentioned before, because it can tell, gives us a lot of information about the health of the implant. And this is something a surgeon needs to know before going into surgery. So regarding staging and follow-up, a PET uh, scan or a CT scan are the most appropriate tests. I'm gonna uh, share with you a, a short timeline of uh, the BALCL history that started with the first FDA safety communication on 2011 to the 2015 RUN panel consensus that established the clinical diagnostic criteria, the treatment and post-operative follow-up. And then on July 2016, the WHO lymphoma classification was updated, including BILCL as a distinct pathology. Then to the 2019 uh, France NSM and Australian TGA ban of microtextures and polyurethane breast implants. And finally, to the uh, recall of allergen biocell surface implants in 2019. So 10 years have uh, passed. And you know, as of now, we have classified the disease. Uh, we have established diagnostic and management um, protocols. We are uh, working on etiology. We know a lot about the pathogenesis. But did we really raise awareness around the world? Or should we be uh, a bit more careful? I would like to share with you a case which uh, explains what I mean. So this is a case of a patient, uh, a 76-year-old woman that presented in our outpatient clinic on June 2019 with a, what we say a textbook presentation of BILCL. She had a history of a right radical mastectomy, expander and implant reconstruction with textured implants. Uh, I will show you later what kind of implants she had. She came to consultation in our clinic for recurrent effusions. So we performed an ultrasound, identified the effusion, uh, sent it to pathology, Professor Di Napoli, uh, studied this effusion, and then the result came back and it was a BILCL. The patient received surgery and a PET scan preoperatively, and uh, after one month, everything was done. But, and here is why I believe that we need more awareness. This patient's history hides something more complex. So the patient in 2004, she underwent radical mastectomy and placement of a mentor silt expander that was later substituted by an allergan 
by a cell implant in 2005. So in 2018, seven years after the FDA has informed everybody about BILCL, she had implant replacement for a rupture, uh, for implant rupture in a specialized cancer center. And she received a new Allergan BioCell implant. Unfortunately, total capsulectomy was not considered, and only a small part of your capsule was sent to pathology that wasn't able to diagnose anything else than granulation tissue. One month after the implant replacement, the patient presented recurrent effusions that most probably were attributed to the recent surgery and not to the presence of a 15 years old capsule. Multiple ultrasounds were offered to the patient with fine needle aspirations, but no liquid was sent to cytologic analysis or any microbial culture were done. So as I said before, this patient had this history of one year of exams, but nobody thought about the ALCL and she came to us a year after and she had uh, surgery. So the histology of the capsule in that surgery we performed found uh, tumor cells microscopically along the posterior lateral surgical margin of the capsule. So it was, uh, uh, we were giving a diagnosis of R1. So after a multidisciplinary uh, team discussion, we decided to give uh, to the patient radiotherapy in 18 sessions. And right now the patient is free of disease, although initially she had some uh, pickup on the PET scan on her lateral thoracic wall. I will share with you a final case, which shows that uh, patients with a BLCL can still be reconstructed. And this is a case that we uh, deal with uh, eight years ago, it was a patient with uh, a quadratectomy and radiotherapy in 1995. She had delayed breast implant reconstruction with the silicon implants in 2000. She received a radical mastectomy afterwards and uh, latissimus dorsi and uh, implant reconstruction with him again implant. And then 13 years later, she presented to us with a, a seroma. At the time, uh, everybody knew about uh, BLCL, but uh, it was decided to do a total capsulectomy, implant replacement, everything was sent to pathology together with the liquid. So it came back as an ALCL. We removed the implant immediately a month later, and then we offered to the patient a total breast reconstruction with the DF flap. In conclusion, I would like to uh, stress the fact that we should raise the awareness. And uh, despite the fact 10 years have, been, uh, have passed since the initial uh, considerations by the FDA, there are still cases where uh, uh, we should be more careful. We should follow the NCTN guidelines or national guidelines when available and share cases with the authorities. Once more, I would like to invite you to the third World Consensus Conference on BALCL and the seventh International Breast Surgery Workshop this October in Rome. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Sorotos, for your presentation. And uh, thank you uh, for, your, uh, for the examples you gave us uh, through the clinical cases, which uh, other would be very interesting, I believe, for, for our audience. Now we will move on to uh, Dr. Dinapoli. Uh, she is going to, to talk about the anatomopathologic diagnosis. Uh, Ariana Dinapoli is Associate Professor of Pathology at the Sapienza University in Rome, and she's a pathologist and molecular biologist. Uh, has a huge research in uh, focused, uh, focused on the molecular alterations of lymphomas, and solid neoplasms involved in tumor initiation and progression. Ariane Dinapoli has gained documented experience in the field of uh, hematopathology and neoplastic pathology. Uh, Dr. Dinapoli, the floor is yours. The microphone, please. Okay, sorry. Thank you very much. So let's start from the manifestation of the ILCL. We have heard that it could manifest as an effusion or as a solid mass, and that ultrasound is uh, the, the one that we use to, uh, to make an early uh, diagnostic suspicious of the ILCL. Actually, it depends on what type of manifestation we have. We applied a different management. We used to um, aspirate the fusion to set for cytological examination, or alternatively, if there's a solid mass, we will perform a coordinated biopsy followed by histological examination. 
But the late seroma, the seroma that manifests more than one year from implantation is actually uh, the main manifestation of this disease. And it is usually not associated with signs of acute infections like redness or fever. So we call it like cold seroma. We aspirate the fluid as more as we can. Actually, we indicated that 20 ml is the minimal amount, but there are some that aspirated also uh, less amount. And uh, the fluid should then split in two. A part of this fluid should be sent for microbial cultures and the other part for cytological examination. The pathology lab will then split again into the material for doing a smear uh, using the slides uh, and for creating a cell block, meaning that the cells will be uh, fixed informally and embedded in a paraffin block. But the Cytological examination is actually the gold standard to make the diagnosis. You can also use flow cytometry for characterizing the cells in the fluid, but the morphology of the cell are, is essential. So there's a grading, as you can see from this arrow, from morphology to also clonality analysis. There are molecular analysis to understand if there's a rearrangement of the T cell receptor that is monoclonal or polyclonal. But everything starts for us from morphology. That's why we published this paper. So starting from morphology, we decide to cut in two situations. Uh, the one where we can see clearly that there are atypical cells and the one where there are non-atypical cells. So you can see this mirror. There are uh, large uh, atypical cells that could be from medium to large multinucleated cells. Uh, there is a, a, we call it dirty background, meaning that there's a fibrinoid and necrotic material. There are apoptotic bodies that should not be confused with the polymorphonucleates. And there are also mitotic figures that are atypical, like the one that is indicated here. Also, I just want you to notice that there are some cytoplasmic vacuoles in these cells that for somebody could be misinterpreted as uh, the vacuoles of the macrophages, but this is a typical of the ILCL actually as well. Here you can see the cell block, you can still see the morphology and these cells that are called the old mark cells because uh, of these kidney shaped nuclei. You can see that the CD30 that you can clearly perform with other markers on a cell block uh, is uh, positive in more than 90% of the cells because the rest are actually macrophages. No B cells are present uh, and the CD3 that is a marker of T cell is actually present not in all the cases. ALK is completely negative because this is uh, an ALK negative ALCL. You can also perform uh, molecular analysis, as I told you, and you can see this high peak that is indicative of a, mole of a monoclonal rearrangement of the T cell receptor, the receptor that the T cells uh, have on their surface. But we used not to perform it routinely because what we have seen so far is, uh, is enough for making a diagnosis of BISCL in most of the cases. We know that uh, uh, this is a T cell lymphoma actually uh, from the molecular analysis, although, because uh, if you see uh, the, uh, uh, this, um, uh, these markers, uh, the, uh, the, the T cell lineage markers, uh, the CD5, 2, 7, and CD3 are expressed just uh, on a minority of the cases. Uh, these cells are positive constantly for CD30 and in a higher proportion uh, also for CD4, like in this case. They also show um, expression of uh, cytotoxic granules like B and some myeloid associated uh, markers like the CD15. As you can see here, this is uh, one case that was a CD3 negative, but CD4 positive and CD8 negative. Here you have just a few cells that are still expressed as CD3, but this was CD 
for negative and CD8 positive. And this case still retained CD3, but was completely negative for both CD4 and CD8. So uh, there's a, a, a huge, uh, you know, like a scenario that you can have in front of you when you stain the BISCSS. But when you look at seroma like this one, you never think about a BILCL because there are so many granulocytes admixed with some histiocytes that are highlighted also by CD68 staining. These are macrophages and some small lymphocytes, CD3 positive. The CD30 is so rare, 0.02% of the total cellularity. So this is like an acute inflammation. Indeed, when we compare the seroma with the capsule, we found clearly an acute inflammation of the capsule. So here we think that there may be a bacterial infection behind this aroma. There are other cases where instead the, the, the scene is, uh, um, is composed by macrophages. Uh, some are multinucleated. You see again, a lot of vacuoles. And uh, within this vacuole, so you can see sometimes the silicon that you can see also in the capsule or the polyurethan that are these triangles here. Again, the CD30 is very rare. Be careful of the macrophages. Uh, this is a seroma where you can see with this raro, these are uh, just a pieces of a polyurethan, and these are macrophages uh, that stain for CD30. This is not a, a real staining, it's just an artifact. Uh, and why I can say that uh, for sure, because the morphology of the cell is not atypical. These are macrophages, are not uh, anaplastic cells. This is another situation, a lymphocyte-rich seroma. So here we can see a lot of T cells uh, and also the capsule is uh, infiltrated by a lot of T cells. So here the CD30 is a little bit higher, around 1%. We don't know what's behind this, uh, if there's a, a, like a, an hypersensitivity reaction or is an adaptive response to, a, 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 for example, a virus, we actually don't know. But again, here you can not see any mitotic uh, figures or apoptotic bodies, so uh, you feel uh, comfortable in making a, a benign seroma diagnosis. But this is, was a, a, a tricky case because there were the T cells that were from small to medium sized. There were some mitotic figures like the, the ones that you can see here that were also CD30 positive. The CD30 was present in about 5% percent of the cells. So what about this case? Is that again a lymphocyte rich benign seroma or actually is an incipient BI, is an early phase of a BI CL. We perform a T-cell receptor uh, gamma rearrangement and we saw these high two peaks, uh, but actually there was still like a polyclonal background. So we thought it could be like a, an immune response against something. So it was like an acute phase of a lymphocyte reaction against something. And why we decided that this was a benign seroma? Because the CD30 positive cells were completely different from that we used to see in the BILCL seromas. So these were activated benign T cells because the CD30 alone doesn't make any diagnosis of BILCL. Well, uh, our hypothesis uh, goes in the direction uh, the, of Marshall Kading. This was another case uh, that uh, they described the patient at the seroma and they found a T cell receptor that was, uh, uh, you know, uh, rearranged uh, uh, in uh, both the seroma cells, but also in the peripheral blood. So they uh, supposed that there was an expanded population of CD30 positive activated benign T cells uh, that were, uh, you know, uh, consistent uh, with a local and systemic immune response against, again, something that we actually don't know. But there uh, remains a question, uh, is there any uh, 
pre-tumorigenic um, form of the BICL? Uh, could the indolent T-cell-rich seroma eventually uh, transform into uh, an inside of BICL and then into an invasive and metastatic BICL? Similarly to what happened for another uh, CD30 positive disorder that is a cutaneous disorder, the lymphomatoid papillomatosis, where you can see there are some papules composed by T cells and a mixed uh, some uh, CD30 positive cells. Uh, CD30 positive cells. This um, usually spontaneously regress, but sometimes they progress uh, toward a borderline and then a through cutaneous ALCL that is composed by uh, CD30 positive cells and that do not spontaneously regress anymore. But uh, this uh, um, this story uh, uh, starts uh, several years ago. Uh, Miranda in 2012 uh, described two forms of BICL. The one that was composed by a seroma where you can see the tumor cells floating and this fibrinotic uh, necrotic material and that could uh, attach to the surface of the capsule that is uh, this uh, uh, pink part here, but also other cases uh, in which there was a, a, a solid mass with massive infiltration of the capsule and also the tissues that were behind. For Camille Laurent in 2016, uh, this uh, represented two distinct clinical pathological variants of the disease, also because uh, the, the prognosis was completely different among these patients. Uh, but for us, in particular, Clemens knows very well this paper, I guess, uh, for us, there's a continuum from the seroma to the solid mass, because we think that the seroma um, in which the cell are floating stars to invade the capsule. And so you can see there's a T1, T2, T3, and T4, as actually does a solid tumor more than a lymphoma that is thought to be a systemic disease instead of a localized disease. But we actually decided we want to um, stage this lymphoma using the TNM staging system that is one that we use for solid tumors. And uh, uh, then starts the, 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 the problem with how many samples do we have to collect from a capsule to uh, properly uh, stage the disease because sometimes tumor cells can be so few that you have to uh, took so many pieces of the capsule. So we decided with Roberto Miranda to publish this paper that was based uh, on a, a um, on a calculation, and uh, we found that 12 samples were the ideal to uh, correctly stage a BILCL. We actually ink uh, with different colors, so the different parts of the capsule, the superior pole, the inferior pole, the medial, the latter, the anterior, and the posterior, and then we uh, got two samples for each of these parts, and uh, we found great results. Here you can see a, a video, a short video that uh, Michael Sorotos performed, uh, recently performed. I just can't like uh, uh, silence it. Well, uh, there's, uh, um, we have this uh, that uh, give us information uh, on the orientation of the capsule. This is the uh, upper lobe and uh, uh, this is uh, the anterior surface of the capsule Then we measure. And after we have measured it, uh, we uh, start to aspirate the, all the fluid because this is an M block capsulectomy with all the fluid still inside. The professor Santanelli performed. And uh, after the aspiration, I think the, uh, the anterior uh, face of the capsule in yellow and the posterior in green. And then uh, I open the capsule uh, following the lateral to medial and then the superior to inferior pole. And so you have these uh, triangles. And then we removed the uh, implant from the capsule. And uh, as you can see, especially in the posterior area, there was a lot of fibrin material. This uh, material we do not waste it, we collect it because it is very precious uh, in this uh, fibrinous material that are a lot of tumor cells. Sorry. 
And after fixation, the day after, we open again uh, the, uh, the, the capsule that we have already cut. And we look again if there's a fibrous material, we collect it again. And then we look at uh, the whitish areas because these are suspicious. We sample for sure all the, you know, like uh, the, the areas uh, that I showed you before from the paper. But we also look at this whitish area. You can see here that the whitish area corresponded to or a thickening of the capsule. And this is very important. You can see that uh, in this sample, you have the posterior side, anterior side, and in this uh, particular sample, the lateral side. Here you can see a PT1, a stage PT1, because this is the fiber and these are the tumor cells, so CD30 positive. In this case, instead, the tumor cell starts to infiltrate that fibrous capsule, so this is a PT2. But again, uh, be careful of macrophages. Uh, they could simulate BILCL, but with a staining for CD30 and CD, uh, CD68 and CD30, you can clarify the, uh, the issue. But there are also other situations in which the capsule, I have this uh, uh, yellow uh, whitish material that is attached, uh, strongly attached to the surface, especially the posterior one. And uh, indeed there's uh, like a, a very full uh, thickness uh, infiltration of the capsule that in this case was staged as uh, PT4, but also the problem was that the tumor cells uh, reached the, uh, the green green ink, so we decide to write it down as a, for solid tumor, an R1, meaning that there's a residual disease, a microscopical residual disease, and this can be an indication for radiotherapy. Capsulectin should be complete, and Mark Clemens will tell you better about this, but we have just uh, two reports and on our pathology report that if it is complete or not. Uh, here, a case that relapsed because of an incomplete capsulectomy, you can see also that T cell receptor gamma showed the same peak, the same rearrangement, and after a definite capsule removal, uh, she never uh, recurred again. But also there's uh, uh, the, the problem that you may not need to have a full infiltration of the capsule to have a, a, a lymph node metastasis, because you can see this case was a PT2, but was N1 in the axillary lymph node. You can see clearly the larger typical cells that were uh, CD30 positive. The T cell receptor was uh, a little bit more tricky to interpret because this was uh, the peak of the tumor cells, but because tumor cells are, uh, um, are uh, in, mixed with a lot lot of non-neoplastic T cells of the lymph nodes, so you can, uh, you know, easily find uh, the, uh, the, clonal, uh, the clonal peak. The lymph nodes uh, also are very important. Indeed, we decided with uh, Miranda to write it in this paper because actually uh, um, patients can can be misdiagnosed for Hodgkin lymphoma or for systemic LCL because if uh, uh, the main manifestation is an enlarged axillary lymph node, it may happen that they, this will be the first thing that will be removed. And then the pathologist uh, that doesn't know if the patient had or not uh, um, um, a breast implant uh, could make a diagnosis of another lymphoma. And this is very important to, so to to tell to the pathologist if the patient had or not a breast implant and if she experienced a seroma in her life. This is important because to make a diagnosis of a systemic LCL in a lymph node is completely another story. The systemic LCL has a completely um, different prognosis. Uh, it has a poor prognosis uh, that is completely different from the BILCL and uh, the, for example, the cutaneous LCL, we have the same problems. If the patient has something on the skin, we should know it. 
about the genetics, just a few words. Uh, there are uh, several uh, data about uh, the uh, mutations in several genes, and we are trying to collect all the, these species to have the full picture of the genetics of the ILCL. Uh, the, the, the most frequent genetic alterations uh, are in the JAK-STAT signaling pathway, that is uh, the inflammation pathway. And uh, uh, we also mentioned, Santanelli mentioned about a P53 that could be somatically mutated, but also uh, germline mutations uh, could uh, predispose uh, patients uh, to the development of the ILCL within other tumors. Uh, so a P53 is very important, is an oncosuppressor gene, and maybe also associated with a more aggressive uh, uh, BILCL. We also know that uh, patients that are uh, BRCA1 or 2 mutated may have a, a higher risk. Uh, and this is because uh, this is another gene that is crucial in maintaining the genomic integrity. But as I told you, this is uh, another story. The genetics is complicating and, and we are still working on that to have, uh, you know, like the idea ho to whom could be at higher risk to develop the ILCL respect to the others. So just to conclude, we can see that to make a BILCL diagnosis, it's not complicated in most of the cases. It starts for morphology. Just follow the guidelines for the pathological processing of both the serum and the capsule. There are NCCN guidelines, and we also, um, you know, like adjust these NCCI guidelines with the Ministero della Salute Italiano to have an Italian guideline. And uh, also uh, be careful of making a diagnosis of LCL in a lymph node uh, in a patient that is uh, wearing uh, breast implants because it could be a misdiagnosis. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Di Napoli, for your uh, presentation and which gave insights to the anatomopathologic diagnosis of uh, a breast implant associated ALCL. And now we are going to move to our last speaker, uh, uh, Professor Mark Clemens from the uh, United States, who is going to talk about the surgical aspects and management of patients with uh, texture implants. Uh, Dr. Clemens is a board certified in plastic surgery and uh, he's an associate professor in plastic surgery at the University of Texas, Anderson Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Clemens serves as a, an invited uh, context expert uh, to the United States FDA on breast implant safety and is a member of the National Comprehensive Cancer Center Network responsible for international guidelines on the treatment of uh, breast implant associated ALCL. Uh, Dr. Clemens is a well-known scientist, has lectured in uh, more than 30 countries around the world and published more than 150 peer-reviewed articles in uh, international journals and several, several book chapters. And uh, as uh, Professor Santonelli, Dr. Professor Clemens also joined the scientific committee of uh, the European Commission uh, in order to develop the uh, opinion on breast implants associated to ALCL. Uh, Professor Clemens, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, uh, this has really been a, a tour de force uh, uh, synopsis of breast implant ALCL over the past hour. It's been great to see uh, this, this update and also as a preview to what's coming this fall uh, with our, our full meeting. I, I think that it was important to do this half yearly webinar update because there's been so many really important papers that have come out recently that we wanted to highlight. And so I don't think that it's possible to be exhaustive over one hour to cover everything about breast implant ALCL. Instead, I think that it's important to cover the most important updates that have just occurred over the last several months uh, so, that, so that you're kept up to date and also that you get just a taste of what's coming in the fall with the, uh, with the larger conference. Um, and, and it's just been wonderful uh, to see uh, uh, Fabio Mikhail uh, Ariana's uh, presentations, which are really just stunning how much research it has been able to be done, um, particularly when we're coming out of the pandemic, research has been constricted uh, over the last several months. 
Um, I'm an associate vice president and associate professor at MD Anderson Cancer Center. I'll be focusing on the management of patients with uh, textured uh, breast implants. First off, I uh, want to acknowledge that I don't have any personal financial conflicts of interest, but MD Anderson does participate in US clinical trials for both Mentor Corporation as well as establishment labs. And I'm gonna break my talk into three different areas for the management of patients with textured implants. That'll be into counts, counts of BIA, ALCL, the causation, just a touch, not nearly as detailed as Ariana was, but just a touch on what some of the big papers are just in the last couple of months, and a focus on surgical technique and explantation. So with regards to counts, I like to always update um, our, uh, our, our, our listeners on our most recent numbers worldwide. And we can see about 1,142 total world cases with about 37 deaths. Very unfortunately, the the last death that I'm aware of uh, just occurred here at MD Anderson Cancer Center in March. Um, what we can see is that these numbers are actually pretty close uh, to the numbers that we uh, showed in uh, the last meeting in the fall. D do I think that breast implant ALCL has slowed down? No, I, f I find this concerning and I think that probably the COVID pandemic has led to a decrease in reporting of uh, BIA ALCL nationally. We're now just starting to see uh, reporting start to pick up. And an unfortunate consequence is a lot of the patients that I'm getting referred now are more advanced cases. And so I do have concerns that it's been less reporting over the past year and a delay. So as you're looking in your own practices in your own medical center, be particularly weary right now that the cases may be more advanced or more aggressive because of a delay in treatment. Uh, just looking at the use of uh, breast implants in uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center, we place about a thousand breast implants per year. And we can see the effects of breast implant ALCL where we've been traditionally a smooth uh, surface uh, uh, utilizer consistent with the United States. Textured implants increased in popularity uh, through the uh, mid-2015, uh, and then we see that dropping off, uh, really approaching zero usage in uh, uh, textured implants from about the class one device recall of Allergan in 2019. Uh, Fabio brought it up that the FDA confirms that there's no confirmed smooth, pure smooth cases to date. And I just want to emphasize that, that we're not aware of that in any uh, case report, case series, or registry ever published uh, to date. An important manuscript out of the past year was the idea that implant surface, um, specifically a textured surface, could not only just be associated with breast implant ALCL, but also uh, associated with breast cancer recurrence. Uh, this was a, an important study out of South Korea demonstrating that textured implants may have uh, additional uh, factors. And this is in line with what we know about pathogenesis and inf increased inflammation, um, that it can have carcinogenic effects. Um, we look forward to replicating this study to see if uh, other centers have had a similar experience. With all this talk about smooth versus textured, I'd say one of the most common questions that I get is exactly what represents smooth surface implants today. By ISO classification, a smooth implant is anything less than 10 microns in surface. And so while we say smooth, that can also be uh, what a lot of manufacturers refer to as nano surface uh, uh, texturing uh, is also classified as a smooth implant. We see that micro textured is somewhere in between smooth and macro. And then the vast majority of patients uh, have had a macro textured implant when associated with breast implant AL steel. In fact, when device was known, the FDA notified us that 91% of world breast implant AL steel cases were associated with an Allergan macro textured biocell implant. That specifically led to the class one device recall. 
Dr. Santinelli covered quite well um, the epidemiology of the disease. I just want to really highlight the idea of uh, Dr. Cordero's work at Memorial Sloan Kettering, having 10 personal cases out of a 26 year history of 5,700 implants placed. This was the vast majority being Allergan biocell implants. This is the highest risk that we've seen to date. You can't help but wonder if a contributing factor was also that this is a large breast cancer uh, population. Um, and so, the, the South Korean uh, data uh, needs to be uh, validated if, if, if that has any uh, implication here uh, that these were breast cancer patients, they would have higher risks of uh, genetic mutations. But um, this is our, our, our best, most granular data that we have on the risk with macro textured implants. The one of the reasons why I bring this epidemiological study up is, is, is mainly because just over the last six months, we've really seen it attacked by, manufacturer, um, by manufacturers, really trying to uh, discredit the work of some of our uh, largest cancer centers worldwide. So we can see uh, in this uh, one uh, 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 paid surrogate uh, for the um, uh, implant manufacturers described Dr. Cordero's work as, that uh, his results uh, were due to surgical technique on the port of Dr. Cordero or poor institutional hygiene at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center or ineffectual press, uh, breast pocket irrigation with bacitracin. I, I, I wanna push back on this particularly as we're seeing uh, in the United States that uh, bacitracin is actually being um, discontinued uh, for uh, indication uh, for pocket irrigation in the United States. In fact, uh, surgeons in the United States are having to scramble to find alternatives uh, to uh, bacitracin and it's no longer even available as a pocket irrigation. I also wanna strongly push back on this uh, uh, false narrative that somehow the surgical technique uh, was to blame in these, uh, in these cases. Dr. Cordero has spoken for decades on proper uh, breast implant technique. He um, is one of the best of us. And, and, I, and I think that we have to be weary anytime that we see manufacturers uh, trying to uh, attack our national and our international highly respected cancer centers um, for uh, research on this subject. I also want to push back on this idea. We've seen that the microbiome is not distinct uh, between breast implant ALCL as well as uh, 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 normal capsular contractures as well as normal capsules. And so therefore there is no clear trend to distinguish uh, BIA ALCL from controls just based on bacteria uh, that's found on the surface. Uh, we've also uh, published uh, just in the past six months that there's no operative strategy that has been shown to decrease the risk of breast implant ALCL. And so um, while manufacturers may be quick to blame you, the surgeon, uh, I just want you to know that it's not supported by the data, uh, that the clearly the most biggest reason for breast implant ALCL, the cause is, is the surface of the textured implant. For more uh, reading on this surface, on, on this uh, uh, subject, I would draw your attention uh, to epidemiological studies, a, a systematic review that just out, came out a couple of months ago uh, from our group, looking at all of the epidemiological studies on this uh, subject, free for download. And Dr. Santinelli's uh, spectacular article, uh, reviewing uh, the experience of epidemiology of BIA ALCL across Europe uh, in the Aesthetic Surgery Journal. I want to turn our attention now to uh, causation. I'm not going to go into nearly as detailed as an analysis as uh, uh, Ariana did, but I want to draw your attention to this uh, paper that we just had come out uh, the last couple of weeks ago. This was a collaboration between MIT, Rice University, John Hopkins University, and MD Anderson Cancer Center, in which we looked at how breast implant surface predicts foreign body response and upregulates inflammation. This was a six year study. Uh, this was really challenging to bring all of these centers together. Um, and, and, and I can't tell you how much is packed into this paper. It looked at the effects of implant surface in mice as well as in rabbits and then went into 
humans to look at the clinical implications of what was seeing in animals. Um, I, that, that took years and years to accomplish. What we found was the implant surface definitely alters the immune response um, of the body and that surfaces with minimal roughness, what the ISO classifies as smooth surface or less than 10 microns, um, uh, seem to have the lowest inflammation, and that there was actually high levels of immunosuppressive FOXP3 regulatory T cells in that kind of uh, lower uh, smooth uh, uh, um, uh, uh, spot of, of implants. And so there's real implications, I, I think, for the manufacturers on where their development needs to go in the future and, and what kinds of implant surfaces were best for all of the inflammatory sequelae, not just breast implant ALCL, but also capsular contracture. And um, a, a really great article. I, I hope you'll uh, read it. I, I want to uh, highlight the sheer uh, report uh, which uh, Fabio has already done, but also to just hammer home this idea that this was one of the farthest that any uh, government authority has ever gone on uh, what's causing breast implant ALCL. In 2017, they said that there may be an association. Here now in 2021, uh, the sheer recommendation was that there is an association and that there is a moderate weight of evidence for a causal relationship between textured breast implants and ALCL. And so now we can see in 2021, we are finally using the word causation, cause, that there is enough evidence to actually show that there is a causation between the two. I know it may have seemed, uh, particularly for patients and patient advocates, like it took us a long time to get there, uh, to use those words, and that's pretty significant to make that uh, demarcation. And it, and it just shows that the abundance of data that we now have linking uh, a textured surface implant to BIA-ALCL is now crystal clear. Also implications for best practice consent and surveillance. And I'll draw your attention to a summary uh, uh, publication just out now in regulatory toxicology and pharmacology um, talking about what are the most important aspects of the SHEAR uh, report. Also in the SHEAR report is, is, is uh, high advocacy for uh, utilization of breast implant registries around the world. These are four of the most um, uh, successful ones to date uh, uh, in the United States. We're really just getting off the ground just in the last couple of years since 2018. Uh, that one's led by uh, Andrea Pusick, and I highly recommend any of the surgeons on the um, uh, webinar to please participate in these registries or in your local national ones. I want to turn to explantation and the tail end of our talk today. And that, uh, to orient you to this slide, this is the uh, diagnosis uh, for the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which was updated this past January. Um, key components of this is that it's is that um, uh, evaluation of all textured breast implants and really all implants should follow a testing cadence of a ultrasound or MRI evaluation after five years and then retesting every three years thereafter. And that's for proper surveillance of any uh, breast implant or textured breast implant. For a delayed seroma, um, a ultrasound has the highest sensitivity and specificity, as uh, um, Dr. Sorotos uh, pointed out. And our uh, diagnostic test of choice is CD30 immunohistochemistry. Um, ultrasound evaluation in any breast implant will always find a small uh, 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 10, 15 cc fluid collection, which is completely normal. Uh, that doesn't necessarily need to be tested. We're looking for clinically significant fluid collections uh, to test that should be screened. Um, unfortunately, uh, we've tried uh, to bring a blood test um, uh, to make it a reality. We don't have this uh, quite yet, but we do hope that this will be available in the future. Um, this just compares what a normal benign seroma looks like on top to a breast implant ALCL on the bottom. Uh, uh, Ariana uh, very eloquently described 
how uh, normal cells can stain for CD30. However, they'll be usually scant or rare uh, cells, whereas we see confluent staining in uh, breast implant ALCL. And as she pointed out, the diagnosis is usually um, quite straightforward um, when a, a standardized approach is taken of these patients. It, it, we do feel confident that it's but it's fairly um, easy to make this diagnosis now. Um, to do that, uh, the FDA combined with the National Institutes of Health and MD Anderson uh, to make these best practice guidelines for the pathologic diagnosis of BIALCL. This published just in the past year in the Journal of Clinical Oncology and was highlighted in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, put that in perspective, that's the highest impact journal in the world. Um, and this described, as uh, Ariana mentioned, a, a standardized 12 biopsy approach uh, to capsule identification. And that's absolutely key to make sure that you're not missing any disease. Diagnose or treatment usually progresses with surgery and surgery alone. Um, and what's the effect of all of this data uh, just on our own practice at MD Anderson? We can see um, these are all reasons for explantation. All of the colors are different reasons why we might explant over the last decade at MD Anderson. And based on new guidelines, new information that we're aware, we see, do see an increase in explantations. And that's in line with what we're seeing nationally is more explantations in the United States, jumping up about 30% over uh, historical averages. Now, while there's a small orange band of actual treatment of breast implant ALCL, we've treated about 70 patients to date. We also do see a concerning trend of fear or risk of BIA ALCL, that gray bar, um, increasing significantly. We do try to um, discourage patients from uh, uh, prophylactic explantation. It's not recommended by any government authority or national society. Um, we don't see that there's any effect on risk. Patients can still develop breast implant ALCL after explantation, even after a total capsulectomy. And so therefore, um, it's important to describe to patients that it may not affect their risk um, uh, by having that disease or switching uh, to smooth implants. This is just demonstrates what I just described is this is a patient with a 48 year old uh, had a late seroma six years prior, had explant, a near uh, total capsulectomy, so about 90 to 95% of the capsule was removed, according to the surgeon, and a mastopexy. And you can see in these pictures, she has no implant in any of these pictures. However, six years later, she developed a large fluid collection, again, of the chest wall. It was biopsy-proven breast implant, ALCL. And when we went back and tested the original pathology specimens from six years prior, we found breast implant ALCL. This speaks to that it's indolent, it's slow growing. Uh, it had started to form into masses onto the chest wall. Uh, so it did continue to progress. And this just demonstrates that we're not aware if there's any possible risk reduction after a patient has been exposed to textured implants. So therefore, complete surgery is the treatment of choice. Um, usually we say uh, no tumor on inked margins. However, um, exact margins are still uh, under um, uh, research. And um, we don't know the effects of other diseases simultaneous. Uh, for instance, in the top picture is a patient with breast implant ALCL and recurrent breast cancer. On the bottom is a picture of breast implant ALCL and lung cancer. Um, so because of the genetic underlying genetic um, uh, uh, abnormalities, these patients can have um, other uh, cancers presenting simultaneously. Um, one thing that I want to uh, just point out to a manuscript that just came out the last couple of weeks was that uh, at MD Anderson, we looked at 10 patients that had serial biopsies of breast implant ALCL. That means that they had multiple biopsies available prior to diagnosis. Those biopsies had occurred anywhere from six months 
to four years previously. And what we found was an incredibly high rate of missed disease when they didn't test for CD30. And this led to inadequate uh, management and progression of disease. In fact, 100% of the patients had persistent disease through all of that time period. There was no spontaneous regression. We really have never seen uh, credible evidence that that can even occur. And there was 50 to 70% of progressive disease. The disease actually got worse. So there is progression if, uh, if left untreated and no standard of care therapy. And this just demonstrates um, how that occurred in one of uh, a patient who developed a multi-drug resistant breast implant ALCL. And this was the patient that ultimately expired uh, this past March. Um, so we are seeing that we don't always have uh, chemotherapy that can treat these trace patients in advanced disease. For further information on how to uh, manage textured implant patients, I draw your attention to these two articles that just came out in the last couple of months on uh, explantation strategies. And I'm going to end there, that the disease is emerging. The risk is manufacturer-specific. COVID likely has un uh, caused an under-reporting. Uh, textured implants now can cause breast implant ALCL. And also, too, it's critically important that um, there are no known risk-reducing procedures and see, see in guidelines or the treatment of choice. You should always test a fluid collection before performing surgery, test before cut, and always perform a PET CT scan or imaging, image before treat. If you'd like further information, the ASPS website has downloadable information for surgeons and patients on this subject, and please attend our conference uh, this coming fall. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Clements, for your excellent presentation. And I would like to thank all uh, speakers uh, for uh, the information given, and I believe that our audience enjoyed uh, their talks as we did here. Now we will move uh, to uh, the discussion with the panelists and based on uh, the questions we have received. Uh, to answer a, a question regarding uh, uh, whether the recordings uh, will be available, uh, yes, I believe that the recordings will be available uh, through the website, so uh, you will receive information where you can find uh, the recording of uh, this webinar. Uh, I will start with uh, Professor Sandanelli uh, regarding uh, a question we received. Uh, by uh, a colleague who said that uh, you mentioned, uh, Professor Sandanelli, that uh, to obtain strong evidence, we must have other non-conflicting conflicting lines of evidence. Would you say that uh, bacterial biofilm uh, FE pathogenesis hypothesis has now been disproven? Well, thank you for the question, which is very interesting. First, let me uh, underline that uh, the recording will be available on the website uh, www.ibsvu.et. Uh, so you will find the recording on the website. So concerning the question, <clears throat> well, uh, I think that the biofilm ethiopathogenesis during time uh, is losing popularity because of uh, uh, they were not able to demonstrate uh, the same lab to confirm their research. So that was quite uh, important that they were able to, to confirm the results. Uh, but most important, there are other works from other research groups like uh, Jennifer Walker, who demonstrate that the microbiome is uh, patient specific and it is not disease specific. So I think that the importance of the biofilm is uh, losing importance. And uh, it's not exactly the same, the, 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 the line and the evidence. I mean, this is exactly the last missing point. We don't know if this is due to biofilm, most probably not. And the most probably uh, theories that we can work on it is the friction and the particulate uh, doing, creating inflammation. Thank you, Professor Antonelli. Another question from a colleague is that he wanted to, or she wanted to know uh, if uh, there is any relationship between the implant placement plane and uh, anaplastic large lymphomas. Uh, maybe Dr. Sorotos could answer this question. We received the same question. 
Yeah, we received the same question, I think, in the last World Consensus Conference, and Professor Clements answered it. Uh, there is no relationship between implant replacement plate and anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So the answer is no. Thank you. Uh, and another question we received is, uh, what are the thoughts we have on a possible pre-maligland CD30 step on BIA ALCL, and uh, whether you believe that uh, this will lead to any changes on how to manage uh, patients? Probably Dr. Di Napoli. Yes, thanks. Well, uh, we look carefully to all the seromas because we were looking for these pre-malignant forms, but actually I found a couple of patients that were particularly rich in CD30 positive cells uh, as one uh, that I show you before in my presentation, but actually none of these patients developed the BIACL clearly, but you know, um, there are some patients that develop uh, um, recurrent seromas that finally uh, will undergo uh, surgery. So actually in some of these patients, we do not have follow-up, a clear follow-up. So I, I can tell you if there's a, a pre-malignant stage, but we actually think that there should be something that at a certain point starts. I don't think that every, everything explode, you know, there should be something that may be like uh, not clinically evident, but there should be something. We Thank cannot, you. you know, monitoring. You, you see that the, the lymphomatoid papulosis that is a cutaneous disease, you can clearly monitoring it because, you know, it's on the surface of the, of the skin. This is something that is inside. The process for me, in my opinion, begins in the capsule. That is something that you cannot monitor. The cells are the T cells of the inflammation that... Uh, is always there that a certain point starts to you know transform into malignant cells, but it's difficult to monitoring that. Thank you. Another question you received. I'd like to ask a oh. clarification uh, from uh, Ariana on, on that. Um, your work on uh, looking for pre-malignant lesions has really been so intriguing and, 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 and really pushed our understanding forward. I, I have seen the, your, your paper sometimes put up by um, uh, some speakers uh, and they'll say this justifies that um, I, I think when they hear lymphoproliferative, they think benign and not cancer. And I have even seen some speakers put your paper up and say, look, uh, they have shown that this is uh, completely benign and that it's not a, a cancer. So maybe we can just clarify. Yes. Um, do you I think sure. that it's uh, lymphoproliferative at, at all stages? Is it only when it's in a fluid collection or is it a pre-malignant lesion that might be lymphoproliferative? And does that mean that this is a benign disease or, or not a cancer somehow? So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, Mark, because I understand that it is a very difficult thing to understand. The word disorder is something that is not clear. When we call, we hematopathologists, I mean, we call something, this is a lymphoproliferative disorder. We mean something that is not completely benign, but it's not completely a lymphoma. So what's the difference between these two things. Um, we look at lymphoma, uh, lymphocytes as cells that are or benign or malignant, but actually they transform from benign to become malignant. And during this transformation, they acquire different uh, uh, alterations. So it may be that you at the beginning, you have a lymphocytes that have just one alteration and then they proliferate too much. So they, uh, at the beginning, respond to an antigen for example, a bacteria, whatever it is. And if they are completely benign, a certain point, this inflammation should stop. 
But if there's a disorder in the immune system, the, uh, the, 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 the lymphoproliferation, the inflammation keep on going without stopping. So this is something that is uh, not completely normal, you know? So this is uh, already something that is pathological. But this doesn't mean that the, the cells are able to uh, spread uh, throughout all your body. So there are some uh, lymphomas in the uh, revised version of the classification of lymphoma that have been you know, like downgraded as a lymphoproliferative disorders uh, because they have uh, a not very aggressive uh, behavior. Because we prefer to use the word lymphoma for something that has a, a, an aggressive behavior so that you have tr to treat it. So the papulosis lymphomatoid papulosis uh, is a disorder because actually it has also a risk to progress to a full lymphoma. So in my opinion, the ILCL may start from something in the capsule, the lymphocytes are in the capsules that at a certain point starts to proliferate maybe too much. They do not respond correctly to, you know, the, the message to arrest, uh, you know, like the proliferation. And then uh, this allowed the accumulation of other mutations uh, that favor the completeness of transformation of the cells to a fully malignant cells. So what we see now is a lymphoma. When we make the diagnosis of the ILCL, we make the diagnosis of a lymphoma because you should treat the patient. I don't believe on the hypothesis that a ILCL could spontaneously regress. You know, I mean, you heard me several times about this. I don't think that it, it could regress spontaneously. You should treat it somehow. Instead, if you have a seroma with a small T cells, it may happen that this, you know, like you aspirate it and then for a certain lapse of time, you don't have any other seroma. But that patient could have again a relapse of seroma, and then again another one. So we don't know exactly when the second hit, the mutational second hit comes. So the point is that you have to follow all the patients that experience seroma, and you always have to check how many a typical CD30 positive cells there are to understand if actually this would be patients that already have maybe a disorder that may predispose to be ILCL. This is what, in my opinion, could be the scenario. But we, we, we would like you know, to uh, have the strength of molecular analysis, and then we should perform molecular analysis on all the seromas especially those that are enriched in lymphocytes to understand if there are some that have already the first hit, the molecular hit, probably that gives a, a higher proliferation of the cells that not respond to the stop message, you know, that other cells uh, gives them. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. DiNapoli. Another question we received is uh, a colleague, asks uh, whether there are studies as uh, cytology, histology, or pathology uh, regarding uh, uh, what occurs in the body prior to seeing formal BIA ALCL. So it's connected, I think, uh, somehow. Well, we know that there are some patients that develop like skin rashes, especially on the breast with the ILC hell. We had a, a one patient that has skin rashes and we also perform a biopsy on the skin. Uh, on the skin. And actually I found like um, a psoriasiformic uh, infiltrate of cells, but that was not a lymphoma, a localization of the lymphoma. So the point is what it is, uh, it's just a manifestation, uh, in my opinion, of uh, a disorder of the immune system. You can think about other, to other lymphomas like uh, the peripheral T cell lymphomas, the angiomonoblastic uh, patients with an 
gangliomyeloblastic T cell lymphoma um, uh, experience uh, uh, cutaneous rashes. So why do they have cutaneous rashes? Because they have something wrong with the immune system. So maybe the cytokines that the tumor cells, uh, you know, like uh, release, uh, um, um, trigger something in the other cells. And so you may have this manifestation, but we should be careful in considering all these aspects uh, as, uh, you know, like uh, um, connected strictly to BISL, because we all know that there's also the Asia syndrome. So there are patients that have these uh, autoimmune uh, manifestations, rheumatoid uh, uh, disorders uh, that have been postulated to be connected with the presence of the breast implants. So it may be that you may have a manifestation of uh, an immune system disorder and not to a lymphoma. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Napoli. Another question uh, is regarding the opinion that uh, Skier uh, published recently uh, asks, uh, there should be other considerations apart from ISO classification regarding surface. What do you think? Uh, Professor Sandanelli. Yes, I think that's a very interesting question. Of course, I must disclose the fact that uh, more than 50% of this group belongs to the share. So our opinion is, uh, of course, online with the share. And uh, we feel, uh, and I was uh, specifically taking care of this part of the document. So uh, my feeling was that uh, we cannot classify implant according to the physical property only, because it's not something that you are going to buy in IKEA, but it's something that you are, to, uh, you are going to put inside your body. So the, the interest of uh, scientists and, uh, and should be, of course, in line with the interest of a patient, it is what does it happen once you put this device into your body? So. The, 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 the research line are going in the direction of having an implant-based inflammatory classification, independently of the uh, specific physical surface characteristic. That will be probably part of a second uh, investigation once we find out that an implant is giving too much inflammation, which of course is not good for the body. Thank you. Another interesting, interesting question is how safe is putting new implants after removal from uh, breast implant associated AACL. Oh, so what do you think, Dr. Santanelli or Dr. Clemens? Or Mark, both? maybe you can. Yeah, so we feel completely comfortable with that, um, with that approach, doing an immediate smooth implant reconstruction if the patient so chooses. Uh, again, we haven't seen any uh, reports of a pure smooth only um, uh, case to date. Uh, and we, we published that experience of doing an, an immediate reconstruction. If um, there's any concerns about uh, an incomplete resection or uh, retained disease, um, that uh, reconstruction can be delayed. Uh, we've also uh, seen that some patients uh, are implant adverse having gone through this and so therefore would rather have an autologous reconstruction. Uh, as well. So I, I, I think that surgeons can be comfortable offering a smooth implant uh, to, uh, to a patient uh, safely, um, but that, um, that you really have to listen to the uh, patient's expectations um, because having gone through a disease that was related to a breast implant, uh, they can be understandably hesitant to uh, get another implant. And um, that should be well, offered to them, not uh, obviously uh, pushed upon them in any way. And if I may stress, uh, you should, you surgeon should feel comfortable with the radical and block excision you have done in order to proceed with immediate reconstruction. That's very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I don't know if uh, our colleagues, uh, our speakers want to add something else or uh, to answered some specific patients questions that are uh, in the question and answers. Uh, is there something else you want to add? Otherwise, I will ask you to uh, give uh, uh, your last sentence uh, regarding this uh, webinar uh, as a final closing. Well, what do you think, uh, Mark, about this uh, question from Connie Caron?
Yeah, so that's a, a, a real challenge. Uh, uh, she describes, I have a hard mass after explantation of a textured implant. Um, and it's approximately seven months thereafter. I really hate uh, making any kind of uh, personal uh, treatment recommendations without actually evaluating, seeing a patient, knowing exactly um, what's happening and, and particularly contradicting a, a treating physician who, who has that uh, extra information. Um, I, I can uh, therefore speak in generalities that if you have concerns about it, possibly seeking a second opinion uh, from a second surgeon uh, would be advisable if, if you have questions about um, uh, currently what you're, you're experiencing uh, right now. I do also want to refer to another uh, question uh, that was asked, why not about prophylactic removal? Um, it seems to go just beyond fears. If total capsulectomy and removal of the implants is the cure in a disease, why not do it uh, prophylactically? Um, so um, those are great points to even bring up the analogy of asbestos. Let's, let's just think about that. In all of the manuscripts that we've written, uh, we've actually used the term uh, complete surgical excision. We haven't just said explantation and total capsulectomy. Uh, total capsulectomy is something you frequently do for capsular contracture, um, whereas we usually say complete surgical resection. That includes uh, imaging ahead of time, looking for associated masses, uh, removing those, um, uh, usually taking a, a rim of healthy tissue all the way around. It's much more aggressive than just a total capsulectomy and implant removal. Um, what we have seen is, is Definitely some cases we're aware of three. We published on this in the past year. Um, uh, disease occurring after a total capsulectomy and implant removal. So we don't know what is a risk-reducing procedure or if a risk-reducing procedure exists. You bring up the analogy of asbestos. Why would you continue to live in that house? I think that the analogy is actually valid, but for a different reason. Uh, you can live in an asbestos house as a child. You can then move, live in multiple different houses throughout your entire life, and then develop uh, mesothelioma when you're 60 years old. Um, there's not much you can do in the interim if you've already been exposed uh, to the disease when you were a child. And so, um, therefore, we, we have not figured out risk-reducing procedures. There may be some. Um, but I don't want to encourage women to run out and explant if, if it's not clear that that has any effect for them whatsoever. Um, so we, we always want to make um, evidence-based decisions, um, uh, particularly when we would make a, a, a recommendation that would affect at least 3 million textured implant patients in the United States, probably closer to 20 million worldwide. Um, we, we, we want to make sure that we're not harming them, um, but we're actually truly helping them. Thank you. Uh, another interesting question, probably to all speakers, but especially to Dr. Dinopoli, is how close we are to have a screening test <laughs> to assess we, women at a high risk of, uh, of developing a BIA-LCL. What do you think? Well, this is our goal. I always say that it's like two years that I'm saying that, but because of the COVID pandemic, everything slowed down. We will actually working right now on this topic and uh, we hopefully have some results soon. Well, this is our goal. We would like to, you know, like stratify patients uh, uh, to understand which are um, the, the ones that have a, a higher risk for developing BILCL. Because actually, as Mark said, I mean, there are 30 million persons that uh, wear breast implants, uh, also texture implants, and uh, they do not fortunately develop uh, uh, BILCL. So the numbers of patients that had this disease is not equal to the, uh, the, 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 the texture implants. So for sure, there's a predisposition. So we need to understand which are the factors that could predispose. But um, I think that could not be an easy game because there are several 
factors that could, you know, uh, take part in this. So we um, talk about uh, genes like P53 and so the patients that have the from many developed BILCL, but I mean, these patients unfortunately develop so many cancers as well as genes like BRCA1 and 2. But there should be other genes uh, that may predispose particularly the BI to the BILCL tumor. Thank you. What, uh, what others believe, what uh, Dr. Clemens uh, believes, or Dr. Sorotos? I would, or Dr. I, would add one, I would add one practical aspect about this. Of course, this is science, and we hope to fully understand everything and to be able to predict who's going to have a BLCL and who's not. Nevertheless, <clears throat> differently from, let's say, the cancer due to smoke, I mean, we have a second chance. We have a cigarette that we can smoke that do not give cancer, which is the smooth implant. So I think that the problem will be solved by the, in, by the, the patient themselves and their uh, really understanding and smartness. Because uh, in the long future, a uh, patient will react first and choose for a cigarette that do not give cancer, which is the smooth implant. That's my feeling. Thank you. Dr. Clemens, Dr. Sorotos. I, I, I can't add anything uh, beyond that. I, I just want to say it, it, it's been an honor. I, I, I greatly respect all the other panelists and it, it's just so exciting to see how much uh, work has come out in the last uh, couple of months. And I really look forward to uh, seeing everybody in person in, in October and I hope a lot of the uh, attendees will join us as well. Thank you. So uh, your final remarks, uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Sorotos. So I'm really honored to have participated in this webinar. I think that uh, what is uh, should remain is that awareness is not hasn't been reached at the level that we should uh, be in order to diagnose patients promptly and uh, offer them treatment. Uh, I think in the future we should focus on the etiology. And of course, uh, the work of uh, the hardest work will be for uh, um, scientists like uh, Professor DiNapoli, who is going to have to work on diagnosing better, on preventing, and, uh, and, and this will be the biggest challenge. So I thank you all, and I hope to see you in Rome in October uh, 2021. Thank you, Dr. Sorotos. Uh, Dr. DiNapoli, a brief closure. Oh, I don't know. I mean, uh, it's so important to take part to these discussions. I always learn something from you guys, and uh, I really thank you for this uh, occasion. Well, I just want to point out that I think that we... Uh, uh, we reach a high level of diagnosing now in the last years, uh, several, uh, you know, pathologists know now how to diagnose BILCL, and this is for me a success. Thank you. And the uh, final remark by Professor Santanelli. Well, it's quite easy for me to remark only one thing that I must thank you very much, the speakers and the participants to this webinar, and not only, but also <laughs> yeah, the, the people that participated to the last. And I thank you very much because I had the opportunity to share knowledge from very important scientists and to spread it around. So thank you to join the faculty. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the closure of this webinar. I would like to thank all the audience and, of course, the speakers. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye. you. Be safe. Bye. Thank you.